Abda'u bismillahi warrahmani Wa birrahimi da'imil ihsani Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad Sayyid al-awwalina wal-akhirin wal-mab'utha rahmatin lil-alamin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we, we thank Allah and we ask for his help and his assistance and ask for his tawfiq wa ma tawfiq illa billah Inshallah, hopefully, we pray to Allah that everyone benefited from the Durus on Imam Tahawi's Aqidah. Inshallah, I recommend to everyone to continue in their learning of it and also to try to memorize, if you can, uh, the booklet that we gave out. So, inshallah, we're going to continue on where we left off. And this is on. Last time we believed, I think it was 27, and we spoke basically that all of the creation, يَتَقَلَّبُونَ فِي مَشِيئَتِهِ بَيْنَ فَضْلِهِ وَعَدْلِهِ That the entire creation, uh, Yahya will help us to determine what page we're on. The entire creation moves between his fadl and his adl. And fadl we mentioned, the khair that you have is the fadl of Allah. And we say fadl because nothing is wajib upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not obligated to do anything for anyone. If Allah was obligated to do something, that means he would have been mukallaf. And who made him mukallaf? We don't accept that. Nothing is wajib for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The deviant group Mu'tazilite believed that things were wajib for Allah. We reject that. Some of the hadith at times appears zahiran and outwardly that they're saying something is wajib for Allah, but the zahir is not taken. The apparent literal meaning of the hadith would not be taken. And this is something very important. May Allah bless you and I, that when you study and you read material without the guidance of a proper teacher, you could make mistakes because you'll take some hadith literally that are not to be taken literally. But again, as we mentioned in the first class, because of the depth of the Arabic language, people make mistakes because they don't see the subtle nuances of what is being said. وَهُوَ مُتَعَالْ عَنِ الْأَضْدَادِ وَالْأَنْدَادِ He transcends having any opposites or peers. And this could best be understood that no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, well, first of all, the andad, they say, is something that could be compared to Allah, and we know that He has no peer in that, so there's no likeness. And the opposite, one can say that it has to do with someone who has the power, the ability to overpower his or another will other than his. So because there's nothing like the likeness of Allah, therefore he cannot have a peer nor anyone as an opposite because uh, his commands and his um, uh, hukum overrides all others and no one else has any affair in it. Um, point number 29. لا راد لقضائه ولا معقب لحكم لحكمه ولا غالب لأمره. No one can thwart his decree because we said whatever is decreed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, no one can change that, override his, overrule his judgment. That his judgments and his hukum will be carried out or override his command. No one can override the command of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. These are pretty much in line with what we have covered the last couple of days. And point number 30, the next one, he says, Amanna bidhalika kullihi wa ayqana wa ayqanna anna kulla min indihi And we are certain and believe in all that is mentioned before. And now, after, when we say kullihi, it means all of what he has been covering up until this point. That we believe in all of those things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ الْمُصْطَفَى وَالنَّبِيُّهُ الْمُشْتَبَى وَرَسُولِهِ الْمُرْتَضَى وَرَسُولُهُ الْمُرْتَضَى وَرَسُولَهُ الْمُرْتَضَى 
uh, we believe that and that. So wa anna meaning that wow is going back to we believe bi tawfiqillah. We say about Allah bi tawfiqillah. So this is called wow al altaf. It's bringing back now, and we also basically he's saying and we believe also that Muhammad is abduhu al Mustafa. He is the abd of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Abd is translated as just as a servant or slave, but this is inaccurate. This doesn't give quite the description of what the ulama are trying to say. The highest honor that Allah Ta'ala has given any servant is the word abd. And the reason why, as one of the ulama once pointed out, that if you're not the abd of Allah, you're the abd of something else. You're either the servant of your desires or you're servant of the dunya, or you're a slave to your passions and desires. You're a slave to something. You have some uh, ubudiyah to something that you're stuck in. But the Prophet ﷺ, he's Abdullah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Subhana ladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa. The word that Allah honored the Prophet ﷺ is with is abdihi. And in another ayah, Walamma qama Abdullah. And when Abdullah stood up. So this is the name of Rasulullah, the title that is given to him, Abduhu. He is Allah's servant alone. Al-Mustafa, he is the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is in ishara to a hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala akhtara Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Adam amongst the creation and chose from Adam and selected from Adam. When we say chose, we mean here that he selected, preferred. Okay? From Adam, alayhi salam, Ibrahim. And from Sayyidina Ibrahim, Ismail alayhi salam and from Ismail Kinana and from Bani Kinana Quraysh and from Quraysh Bani Hashim and from Bani Hashim the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, who at the end of this says waqtarani min Bani Hashim fa ana khiyar min khiyar min khiyar wala fakhar so i am the select of the select of the select and i'm not boasting why does he say wala fakhar because the ulama say he was commanded to inform the people of his rank and his status the Prophet ﷺ never boasted out of his own will to boast or to tell the people, but Allah commanded him to inform the people. Okay, so this is not a boast from his own blessed self who is so humble, but it's a commandment from Allah to tell them so. The Prophet ﷺ, not only that, but in all the families going back to Adam, every single one of his forefathers were married and had legitimate children, and all of them were muwahidun. Despite that, a lot of the ulama make mistakes in this. All of the forefathers of Rasulullah were muwahidun and believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of them back. As for the ayat of the Quran that you see, Abi, Abi does not mean father in the Arabic language. Proven by the Quran itself. When Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam asked his children, what you, you worship after I die? He said, we will worship your Lord and the Lord of our fathers, Aba'ana. And then he mentions in there, Ismail, which is not his Aba, not his, but is his uncle. So Abi could also mean uncle. And this is a point that's important because Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi argues this very brilliantly in which he says that the mushrikun and the kuffar are najis. No way can they hold the Messenger of Allah in their najisness to transmit the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, as for his parents, this is also a silly debate amongst Muslims in our time that the father of the Prophet ﷺ is in the fire and ridiculous things like that when Imam Suyuti, the great scholar of Islam, and many ulama have already worked this out hundreds of years ago. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Yasin that he does not punish a people till he sends him a messenger, his father died before he received the message, how is he punished? As for any weak hadith that you bring that has multiple meanings, when there's a Quranic ayah that is clear, hadith are not to be taken except in light of that verse in the Quran and will not override the Quran. And the Asha'ira, which is the Ahl Sunnah of Jama'a school, they use a primary ayah, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We do not punish a people until we send them a messenger. That is the predominant view of our ulama. So there's no punishment until you get the risala. So this is why Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi and my shaykh is very strict on this. Anyone who says other than that about the Messenger of Allah, la'anahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has cursed them. Why? Because Qadi Abu Bakr says that they harm the Messenger of Allah by saying terrible things about his father. 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those that harm Allah and His Messenger, you then, yani they say something harmful, Allah's punished, Allah's cursed them in this world and the next. People should have different things to worry themselves over than the Messenger of Allah's father, Sidi Abdullah, his blessed father, and his blessed mother. His blessed mother, Sayyida Amina, uh, who was the best of the women in terms of how can Allah choose somebody who would uh, bear the best of mankind while her herself, she's in a bad state? This is such su al adab between the people of this time. Although Tahawi doesn't bring that on there, these are side points that are also important as you study and there's uh, other points to be made. And he is his preeminent prophet, wa nabiyyi al-mushtaba wa rasooluh al-murtada, and he is well pleased with his noble prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is the khatim al-anbiya, he is the khatim, he is the final of all the messengers of Allah. Of course, from Adam until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's not a very strong authentic narration of how many there are that you're held accountable by aqidah. There are 25 that are mentioned in the Quran that you are held by aqidah to believe in. But there are some narrations that mention 124,000 and 224,000. Allahu ta'ala The scholars always mention that that is narrated, but in aqidah, only that which is clear, unequivocal from the Qur'an and from the Tawata traditions is what is considered to be part of Aqidah that you're bound to believe in. If it comes from traditions that are weak or there's some ambiguity in it, yani it's not a clear or qat'i in its meaning, etc., then scholars, they still may believe in it, but they don't make it an article of faith that if you don't believe in it, you'll be a kafir. This is why... And our dear Imam, he's here, Mufti Hanafi, our usul of our madhab, the Hanafis are very brilliant in this, right? So we have fard and haram. If you reject the status of any of them, you become a kafir. Because we only establish fard and haram through absolute qat'i proof that has no ambiguity in it. Okay? So it makes it very clear and very simple. But those are not established except through strong, unequivocal proofs of the sharia. And the Prophet Sallallahu anyone who says that there's a Prophet after him, of course, and we've had some crazy groups that have emerged, then of course, we reject that and it's heresy. And he's also the Imam al atqiya He's the Imam and the paragon of the pious. Uh, in commentary, some of the scholars mentioned that this Ishara ila Isra, that in the Laylatul Isra al Mi'raj, as you all know, Sayyidina Jibreel came, woke up the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and took him on a night journey on Buraq, and then they went to different areas. He prayed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Bayt al Laham, Bethlehem. They prayed two rakats. He mounted back on Buraq and said, Do you know where you prayed, Ya Rasulullah? He said, No. He said, This is the birthplace of Isa, Bayt al Laham, Bethlehem, the places of khair and important events that took place in those, in those localities. And when he got to Jerusalem, La Bayt al Maqdis, all of the different prophets and all of the prophets were there and present. And they were waiting for him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they were going to pray. As you know, the famous story: they were going to pray, and they were hesitant on who would lead the prayer. And Sayyidina Jibril took and forwarded the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to show, of course, uh, everyone and us as well, so we know his rank that he is the Imam of all of the prophets, and he led them in prayer. And he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in Laylatul Isra, there's actually so many lessons in it, amongst them that. His maqam was known in that night to who he is, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he went up. And in the Quran, it's very interesting because um, we've done several sessions. Inshallah, I can forward you some material, hours and hours on the Isra. Uh, but it, this is a this is a great um, miracle of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but also his high status. So he did lead the prayer, leading all of the other prophets, and. His rank and maqam, of course, is over all of the other prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam above all of his other messengers and made all the other messengers pledge that if he were to come in their time, that they would give victory and would support him and assist him. When he's Sayyid al-Mursaleen, he's the master of all the messengers because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, scored in a hadith, Ana Sayyidu walidi Adam wala fakhar. I am the master or the Sayyid of all of the children of Adam, and it's not a boast because he was commanded to say that. And there's multiple hadiths on this in which he says, Wala fakhar, wala fakhar, amongst the mentioning that he is the first to be resurrected on the day of judgment, he is the first to enter the paradise, to Jannah, 
He's the one that will hold the banner of praise on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And all of these, Wala Fakhar, in his Ummah is Akhirun Awalun. They came last, but they'll enter paradise first. And they're the, multipli- they're the multitude of the people that will enter paradise is from the Ummah of the Chosen One, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So all of us here should feel a great, tremendous honor from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that He selected you to be Muslim. This is an honor and a blessing you really don't have any clue about right now. We're all in a state of sleep because we don't realize the great blessing of this. And that great blessing, uh, we pray to Allah that we enjoy its fruits by dying upon Islam and resurrected upon Islam, being Muslims of the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a great honor. So he's the Sayyid al-Mursaleen, the Sayyid and the Master of all of the Prophets and all of the Arabi wal Ajami wal Nasi Ajma'in, all of the Arabs, non Arabs, and all people. Wa Habibu Rabbil Alameen, and he's the Habib of the Rabbil Alameen, he is the beloved. And once some companions were sitting together talking about the great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how Musa was the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly spoke to, and Isa alayhi salam is the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blew into him his ruh in the way that befits his majesty, and there's commentary on that. And how Ibrahim is the Khalil of Allah, the close, um, intimate uh, one that is near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ came out and he said, I heard what all of you said. You said that uh, Ibrahim is the Khalil of Allah and it is such. And you mentioned that Musa is Kareem Allah and it is such. And that Isa is Ruh Allah and it is such. Wa Habib Allah wa la And the Habib is the highest of all the ranks of anything that you can obviously be described with. He is the most beloved of all of Allah's creatures and all of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. And as we mentioned, every da'wah, every call after him is nothing but deviation and heresy. That the Messenger of Allah is the last Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to all of the jinn and the mankind. Not just mankind, but all of the jinn and there's verses of the Qur'an to prove that. In the next point, 34, he says, وَهُوَ الْمَبْعُوثَ إِلَىٰ عَمَّةِ الْجِنِّ وَالْكَافَةِ الْوَرَىٰ He is the emissary to all of the jinn and the whole of humanity. بِالْحَقِّ وَالْهُدَىٰ With truth and guidance. وَبِالنُورِ وَالْضِيَاءِ And with light and radiance. He brings now next one as in this class as I was hoping to get to the ilahiyat, which pretty much, alhamdulillah, we were able to do and finish. The next section he speaks about the Qur'an bringing it back once again, emphasizing it. وَأَنَّ الْقُرْآنَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ مِنْهُ بَدَأَ بِلَا كَيْفِيَةً The Qur'an is the word of Allah that emanated from him without kayfiyah. And those that were here yesterday, we talked about kayfiyah, modality. It is beyond any description human beings are possibly able to describe with. That's what bila kayfiyah means. It's not a possibility of humans being able to describe it understandings, language, and imagination is limited. So, bila kayf, we don't know. We don't know how. Why? Reiterating our first point from the first day of our classes, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning and He has no end. On top of that, Allah is not bound by time. And so of all, so are all of His attributes. They're pre-eternal. They are qadim. They're not hawade. They are. Ne- they were always pre-eternally existing before time and space, and they will continue after time and space and the end of time, the same, unchanged whatsoever. Change is not an attribute of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. There's no taghir. There's no, and that's what actually the name of Allah Al Haq means. The one who never changes while all others change. So they say, be Abdul Haq, be the one that is straight and right on the point of this deen, and you don't change to that which is wrong except try to increase in good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change. So this is why we don't quite understand the Qur'an. Yes, it emanated from Allah, bila kayfi, as we mentioned the other day, kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is something we don't understand and we cannot describe. It is not in words, it's not in letters, it's not in sounds. It is God-like speech. What is God-like speech? What our mind can never understand. That's why the ulama say, Bila kayf. So this power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his speech is part of his attributes that had no beginning. 
what's important and what you need to leave with from these classes is not to believe in your head that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was looking at the Prophet 1400 years ago and despite what was happening in particular situations, Allah was responding and reacting to those things and revealing and speaking to him in that moment. That is kufr. You cannot believe that. Okay. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Okay, we revealed the whole of the Quran on Laylatul Qadr. And Imam Suyuti, he mentions that that on the Laylatul Qadr, it went from the Lawh al Mahfud and the Sama of the highest heavens down to the Sama Dunya in a single night, the whole Quran. So everything in the Quran that we read was always with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a speech that has no beginning and has no end. Nothing changes. Allah's knowledge also doesn't change. We are part of the creation of Allah, a creation that we are so limited in trying to understand our Creator because He's put us in a realm of a lot of limitations because we are His creation. But what He's told us on the tongue of His Blessed Messenger is He's revealed to us the Qur'an and this Qur'an as analyzed by the great scholars of this religion, all of these meanings were able to be derived. This is why Allah has praised the ulama, a praise that he does not liken to any other people on the earth. Allah bears witness that there is no God but him, and so do the angels, and so do the people of knowledge. There no one else is equated in that ayah in Surah al -Iman. Because they don't just believe, they actually witness and they know. Because the Qur'an, the people of the Qur'an, they're truly people that understand the depth of the Qur'an, the arguments of the Qur'an, and so they reach the highest limits of possibility of understanding both logic and intellect and revelation and they're able to arrive at yaqeen in fadlillah and they have these levels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised. And of course, you know, we're not scholars but we can love the scholars. Love of the ulama is a very important thing because Anas ibn Malik relates a hadith and the ulama say this is the arja hadith that is related, the most hopeful hadith that there is. Anas radiallahu anh said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam is quoted to have said, Al-mar'u ma'a man ahab, people will be with whom they love. So if we don't reach their ranks, yes, but with love we can be with them in the hereafter. We can be with the great imams. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, we be with the great awliya and ulama of this first century, or before them we can be with Sayyidina Abu Bakr, or Umar, or Uthman, or Ali, and before all of them, and on the top of all of them, we hope and we pray to Allah that we're united to be in the presence of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A man got up and he was told, ask what you want, whatever you ask will be accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You have one dua, ask whatever you choose, Allah will give you. He said, I ask for your company, O Messenger of Allah. Asaluka murafaqatuka yaw'anuka in paradise. So, we Muslims were trying to learn this aqidah for the intention and the reason to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no other reason. This is not an intellectual exercise. This is a knowledge that's been passed on by the ulama so that it can penetrate our heart. And as we mentioned, the beautiful scholar Imam Ghaznawi's sharh, لِيَهْدِ la لِنُورِهِ مَنْ yasha. So we can be guided to the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the knowledge of this religion. So he says we have absolute certainty, that is the kalam of Allah, the Qur'an, bil haqiqa. It's absolutely the kalam of Allah. But bila kayfiyah, the kalam that emanates from Allah. What he wanted us to have is the Qur'an, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. And it's the divine words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't know how. We don't know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke this. We don't know how it uh, emerged because that realm is inaccessible for us. What is accessible for us is recitation of the Quran and reading it and reflecting upon its meanings. If you have the qualifications, of course, that book is here for our guidance. And it will always be until the end of time. The same is true for the Tawrat and the Zabur and the Injil and all the other revelations Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down. They're all going to be the same. So inshallah, alhamdulillah, as you leave this class, you will know that it is not something that you will imagine if you ever did, that there was a beginning to the Qur'an, that the Qur'an then we would say would be created. And we do not say that the Qur'an is created. 
ليس he says ليس بمخلوق ككلام البرية unlike human speech it is eternal and uncreated and so the next point Imam Tahawi again he says whoever hears it and alleges it to be human speech فقد كفر if committed kufr whoever listens to it and then says that it resembles human speech or it is like human speech meaning it is any shape has a uh, amthila and it has a likeness to the creation فقد كفر because we said that in the very beginning not only is the essence of Allah لا تفكر في ذات الله you cannot imagine or think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no imagination will ever uh, perceive of him or conceive him and we mention also the beautiful statement in Arabic that nothing will ever, your mind will never attain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكَذَلِكْ Also all of his sifat, all of his attributes are bila kayf. We really truly don't understand them. We are told to believe in them in the best possible way we can understand, knowing our understanding is limited and we truly don't understand. أَجْزُ idrak idrak as Abu Bakr said, the inability to understand Allah is true understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever ascribes to Allah any human quality has blasphemed. I look at subhanAllah over and over and over, Imam Tahawi is constantly bringing back. It's almost like it's a natural tendency in human beings to somehow imagine Allah in some likeness to what they know. This is in a way natural. It kind of comes. You have to train your mind and you have to learn theology and aqidah. And that's what aqidah means. Aqidah in the Arabic language means to tie and connect to something. So we're like rejecting certain things of our mind and then connecting us to ideas or beliefs that are essential, that we need to hold on to for our salvation. So whoever perceives this takes heed and refrains from such statements of the disbelievers and knows that God the Almighty and all of His attributes is utterly unlike humanity. And so there are a few more points that he touches upon. And... Because we've exceeded what we went for our goal, alhamdulillah. <coughs> Perhaps we'll read a few of those. Amongst them is, وَرُؤْيَتُهُ حَقٌ لِأَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ The seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the people of paradise is haq, is true. We believe in it. And we say, bila kayf, as we mentioned yesterday, right? The people of paradise will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the disbelievers will be punished by not being able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next world. And the Mu'tazilite, they disagreed with this, and that's why they're a deviant sect. Every sect that went against the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah fall into one of those 70 something groups that we mentioned. Why? Because they differentiated on belief, not practice, not application of fiqh. If you bleed a little bit in the Hanafi madhab, you lose wudu. In another madhab, you don't. That's not a big issue. Okay, okay, that's furu. Sahaba had differences in furu. But Abu Bakr did not believe in something different than Umar. And Uthman didn't believe in something different than Ali. They all had the same aqidah. So we cannot differentiate in aqidah. The people of the Sunnah and Jama'ah believe we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah for those that enter Jannah. And so this is huge. I was with my teacher once and he told one man, he said, inshallah, you will see Allah. And the person started crying because this is powerful stuff. It's not just stuff we just read and we're just sitting here. We need some uh, classes here in Tasawwuf as well. We just can't sit here and just be not affected. This is powerful stuff. The greatest pleasure in paradise is not all of its pleasures. And paradise has areas of pleasure no angel knows and no prophet ever sent knows. Even our master and chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one knows. It's only Allah's knowledge. That's how amazing Jannah is. Okay? No one knows. But yet, when people see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah, they forget everything else. Everything else becomes obsolete. Of course, how, why not? You're seeing the Lord of Jannah. What is Jannah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Inshallah, we will take comments and questions in just a little bit. There's proofs for that, Imam Al-Tahawi says, and he says, without enclosure or modality. Okay? What does this mean? Enclosure and modality, because enclosure would mean direction, enclosing, somehow surrounding. It's not Allah. Or 
ihatatan, which is uh, 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 in, a, in a perceived way or modality. So ihatatan is actually closure, modality is kayfiya. Kama nataqa bihi kitabi rabbina. And so the ulama, they had in a way left with this verse of the Quran to deal with in trying to understand this. Wujuhu yawma idhin nadira ila rabbiha nadira. And some faces will, will be a glow that day gazing at their Lord. It's in the Quran. Ulama accept it. It is the explanation and its explanation. What tafsiruhu ala ma arad Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala wa alimahu. And it is, it's, it's tafsir is the way Allah wanted it and He knows best about its modality. But we believe in it. And all that is related from the hadith of Sahih in this, we accept and we do not interpret it in our own uh, opinion, in our own whims and desires, as this is forbidden. So inshallah, this, this is where we will stop in the Aqidah of Imam Tahawi. The next sections he goes into are reiteration and some fine points. And I'll leave you with a statement of Imam al-Shafi'i, in which Imam al-Harith al-Muhasibi in one uh, tradition says he went up to Imam Shafi and he asked him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was so profound that I wrote it down and I asked my teacher about it because it's called the Jawami al-Kilim. Imam Shafi was given this gift from Allah to say in two words what we just covered this whole time in Tahawi Zaqib. Basically in single statement. And when he asked about him, what is Aqidah, he says, Allah, Allah tatawahamuhu wa la tattahimuhu. That's it. Allah tatawahamuhu, tatawahamuhu, that you never think or imagine of Allah in any way, because you know you're not allowed to and you're not going to get it. You can say, La tufakiru fi dhatillah. You will never understand Allah. He's beyond grasp. Wala tattahimahu. And do not ever really, do not ever think that Allah does anything without purpose. You should always believe Allah wants good for you and His irada for you, inshallah, is good. Think well of Allah and think well of His creation. Everything that is happening in the world, in the universe, is for a good cause. And Allah has full knowledge of it and there's a full purpose to it. The full purpose to it. Our ignorance is we just don't understand it because we're weak. What do we understand? We don't even understand our own, our own planet. We don't understand our own selves. It's beyond our own understanding. So with that, inshallah, we, uh, we close that out and inshallah give an opportunity to cover what we have, uh, to ask any questions inshallah about what we've covered. Um, and anything you may have, Jazakumullah um, khair. And if not, um, after the questions, then we can go back to this and just take a few minutes to uh, glance over, like a really quick summary of a few minutes. And if anybody has anything on what we covered, like there's this word, what did this mean again? So we can cover it. Because we want you to go home today, inshallah, by uh, taking home something really tangible with you, something that you really grasp and you really learn. You keep this with you, inshallah, and something you can live by and perhaps over time uh, teach people exactly um, what you learned in a safe way that you understood. Jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sallam wa yeah. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, we live in times that Muslims have been traumatized by ignorance. There are people out there that don't say Sayyidina because they misunderstand the way of our tradition. When the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ana Sayyidu Walidi Adam, why can I not call him Sayyid? When he says, he says himself, I am the Sayyid of all of the children of Adam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once said about Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, 
when some people came in, he said, stand up for your Sayyid. Some Imams, unfortunately, purposefully do not like saying Sayyid. I don't understand their ignorance, really. And I say, do what the Adam. Sayyid means master. Not only is the Prophet Sallallahu the master of mankind, Judgment Day is not going to move without his intercession. And the reason why, one of the reasons is, Allah is going to make apparent to everybody on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah and all of the Prophets and all of the Khalq Ajma'een, who's the master of them? Who is the master of all of them? Because until he intercedes, nothing moves. Other than him, no one steps up to intercede. People go to Adam. Adam says, go to Nuh. Go to Ibrahim, one after another after another. They go to one prophet to another, one prophet to another. Until Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam says, why don't you go to the one who Allah Ta'ala has said in the Quran, he's forgiven him all of his past and his future sins. And about sins, we need to add a very important point before we leave. The anbiya of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala do not commit sins. Ashahu, no way. The prophets of Allah have isma, and they have fatana, and they have tabligh, and they have sidq, and they have amana. These are from the necessary attributes of the prophets. If a prophet sins, a'udhu billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, by their guidance, go seek guidance. So, okay, so they lie, I'll follow lies in them. Oh, so they commit sins and we'll go commit in them. For example, Adam alayhi salam did not go to the tree on purpose. Adam went to the tree, there's interpretations. One, he forgot. And whenever you forget, you're not held accountable in sharia. If you sat, had a nice coffee, Reviewing Tahawi, sitting with great friends, and subhanAllah, Vancouver's winter weather. Two hours later, it's Maghrib. You're like, subhanAllah, I forgot to pray. You have not committed sin. You forgot. Completely. If in between you remembered, we should pray uh, later. No, but you completely forgot. The pin is lifted on the one who forgets. So Adam alayhi salam, that's one interpretation. Two, the Sahib of Muharram al Lisan in one of the books of West Africa, he mentions our Shaykh that. Uh, he went to the tree because he thought that the commandment Allah give him, gave him was a recommended one, not a fard one. So he didn't know. And one of the, the wisdom that comes from that is this was what Allah intended. There's nothing wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him the khalifa. And he's exonerated from that. We don't believe Adam was some sinner who got cursed in his children and sent to earth as a banishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنِّي جَاءِنُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ To the angels before he created them. So did Allah not know he's going to do that? Why did he attribute them with khilafah? Like that, all of the prophets are absolutely sinless. No major sin, no minor sin. Before or after nubuwa. Allah is protecting them. They have a special isma and a protection. However, despite that, because of the haiba and the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the day of judgment, nobody steps forward. When they go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes, he makes sajda, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ask and you're granted intercede and your intercession is granted. And this would be a wonderful topic. Imam Ahiyya is here, you can seek knowledge from him where you can ask him about the types of intercession given to the Messenger of Allah that is very unique to him. Okay, there are people go to Jannah, be ready, he's no account. They get up, they're resurrected, Bismillah, Salaamu Alaikum. Good luck for your day of judgment, by the way, Salaamu Alaikum. They're gone. There's a select of this ummah that are like that. He's the master of mankind. And unfortunately, we live in a time people don't know the rank of their own prophet. It's unbelievable. The ignorance that is spreading amongst the ummah. And um, so the Prophet wasallam is the master of all of mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, there's all these proofs. Uh, a very beautiful book that's translated in English you can get is by, um, I believe Aisha Buley might have translated it or it's on the... Um, the uh, Iz ibn Abdul Salam's book on the, what is it called? The Wasail al-Rasul? I forget what it's called. But there's about 40-something or 50-something points why the messenger is the most selected. Amongst, you can go on and on, but there's points in it. So there's no doubt about that. And uh, inshallah, so yeah, absolutely, you know, uh, all of our ulama, you don't, it's not a wajib, like you don't want to say Sayyid, you can say Nabi and Muhammad, there's not no problem with that. But it's when people... They oppose it. There's actually people, if the imam says Sayyidina, they look over him like, what are you doing? That's wrong. And it's like, Astaghfirullah, what are you talking about? Some people say, don't overpraise the Prophet. Allah praised them. No matter what you ever do, you'll never reach the rank of a praise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's ignorance. And if you read the works of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
They praised him to levels of modern standards by some groups of Muslims as shirk. Like Sayyidina Aisha, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawah, and some of the uh, Hassan ibn Thabit. You read their beautiful poetry about the Prophet. It was, mashallah. When you hear it, you're just like, oh, it's so beautiful. He's like, mashallah. See it again. Can I just give you the position? I think, actually, I'm just going to do it. Huh? I think because, okay. Inshallah, we're going to save that for when Imam Yahya and Mufti Shujaat come. They have more qualification to answer those questions. We'll cover the Tahawi, inshallah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let the. Would you have brother and sister? So, uh, my question is how to make sure that when you're reflecting on Islam, about this man, that you're not crossing the line and actually reflecting on what's he thinks of that. You're not reflecting on Sifat al Kamal. Uh, you're not also you're not crossing the line to liking him to other things. So this, I think, is going to be a constant battle between the mind. Subhanallah. If you read some of the higher works in Aqida, it just goes finer and finer and finer. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala save us. I think the important thing is try to learn as much Aqida as you can. Be always in a state of dhikr and pray. And if you're constantly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll see that. For example, I'm drinking my coffee, but I have to see that Allah is the one that is feeding me, satiating me. It's not the drink. If you take medicine, you have to see Allah is the one that's giving you cure. When you are cold, these are all as bad. They're just needs. Allah is the one doing everything. When you walk, are you seeing that it's actually Allah creating all this time and space? When you are getting closer to Allah and raising in rank, are you realizing that's Allah? When you commit sins and Allah punishes you for it, do you not see that this is His uh, punishment against you, His adil that He's giving you because of what you did? This is constant witnessing and you need to constantly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and constantly bring yourself to understand that Allah can never be imagined and the real modality and re reality of His attributes are also beyond your grasp. And constantly re remind yourself, subhanAllah, I'm not able to fully grasp Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the Prophet says, I'm constantly would tell his companions at times, subhanAllah. In the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they say this about Allah, subhanAllah, glory be to him. You know, they translate this, glory be to him. Transcendent is Allah above what they ascribe. In other words, Allah is not like that. Allah is beyond that, constantly. So it's going to be a combo of, I think, reflecting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book, the knowledge, being in a state of dhikr, and constantly being able to ask Allah to remind yourself. If there's any slight slips where you're not in the moment aware, it's not going to be considered kufr or shirk. You know, it's just a natural tendency of the human being. I asked my teacher, I said, Shaykh, sometimes people take medicine, but in that moment, haqiqatan, they believe that it's the medicine giving them cure. In that way, is that not shirk? You know, because they're doing it. And he said, no, it's not considered shirk like that. Because the human being is very weak, and if you pull that standard, how many people are going to fall into serious problems, right? But believe me, there are ulama, there are people very close to Allah that they are constantly witnessing and constantly reminding themselves about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why it's very important to be in dhikr and always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of what you can. Allah ta'ala. Allah Yeah. Yeah. What is the children of Adam? Children of Adam. There's a book. I'm not sure if uh, 
Uh, is it Sakhawi or one of them wrote just on that topic actually? It's a small work in Arabic. I find it inshallah. If you'd like to stay in contact, I can send it. There's a lot of variant hadith on that. Well, here's what we understand. We understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being the choice to make decisions and decide if they want to do good or bad. But we know when they choose to disobey Allah, it is Allah that creates that, Allah that leads them astray. It is Allah doing all of it. Allah is the one that guides, Allah is the one that leaves people astray. So the one in reality creating everything is Allah. But blaming, going astray, you won't get away with that excuse on the Day of Judgment. It's because something in the human being. Something in the human being. But at the same time, the human being has to understand that when he wants to do good, he cannot attribute any of that good to himself. The thought, the irada of good, the going right, and getting the divine success to do what's right is all from Allah. So if a human being sits and actually gets a thought, why don't I worship God? Why don't I just get close to Him? Where'd you just get that thought from? What just made you change your life? Allah. Yahdi me Yesha. He chose you. Instantly grabs you. You're guided. Now, you like to look back and say, I made a dua. You didn't do anything. Allah guided you. Because He from pre-eternity knows you. Knows what you're going to do. Knows what you're going to choose. Some he let them be born Muslim. Many in this room were not born Muslim. Allah still guided them. You know, Allah, there's, we think that these things have to do with external factors. They're all asbab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can guide you without asbab. Our Sheikh, he mentioned that anyone who takes away from the rank of the Prophet is committed kufr. In fact, Qadi Iyad in Shifa said that a person who describes the dirt and turab of Medina as the diminutive form of the Arabic language, should be whipped a few times for his disrespect of the dirt of Medina. What do you think about it? Anyone who just says he's just a man is committed to it. There are many Muslims today, oh, they say, oh, the Prophet, he's just a human that got the Quran. You tell me whoever said that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout his old Quran never once addressed the Prophet by his name directly. He said, Ya 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 Isa, Ya Musa, Ya 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 Mudathir, Ya Ya Nabi. Ulema picked this up. They noticed this. And the best ever commented on this, actually, we did a series in Santa Barbara over seven days on the commentary on the Burda, Asida Burda, by the great illustrious scholar Sheikh Salih. It was the best work I ever saw. He comments and he clarifies things from the Quran and the Sunnah with perfect clarity. So if you want, you should try to get the recordings of that. You will truly be amazed. The Prophet wasallam. this is what saddens me. There are people that go around and they say, well, we're afraid of shirk about the Prophet Sallallahu What are you afraid of? Just read the Quran. Read the Quran and look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu And look at what our ulama have written. It's very clear what our ulama have written. Look at the dis different descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi His shamayil, his wonderful descriptions, his hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu about he had knowledge of all that would occur until the end of time. He told the companions in a single day he stood up at the member from Fajr all the way until Maghrib. The Sahaba said there wasn't a thing that he didn't inform us about. Rasulullah is Rasulullah. And he said in a hadith, no one knows my true reality except my Lord. And people already jumping in and actually think they know everything about the Prophet. 
Abu Bakr and Omar after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. They said, we did not know about him except just a shadow of him. We didn't understand him. Because a man came and it's a long story, but the bottom line is to sit here and try to think like you understand the Prophet you're greatly mistaken. Only Allah knows his Prophet. And those of his companions are best qualified to talk about the Prophet. All these people now have no business speaking about anything of him if they don't have knowledge. And to, to, to put him down in any way is very dangerous. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ was a human being, but not like other human beings, just like a ruby is a stone, but not like other stones. And you just... Um, SubhanAllah, I don't know where to begin. We've done hours and hours and books on just the Shumayl. And when you read the Shumayl, Sayyidah Aisha says she lost a pin in her room. And the Prophet walked in and she found it because of his glow of his blessed face. Okay, how, how do you get that? If he's just a normal person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet in the Quran, that's why I'm not qualified. That say, I am a man like you, reveal to me. You ha'ilayh. That means he's not like you. He is human in the sense that you can go and see him, hold him, right? Kiss his blessed hand and share that. He ate, he dressed only to teach people actually. Only to teach people. How to eat, how to walk, how to live. Prophesy someone when he went to sleep, he used to wake up for Fajr. He didn't, one of his chasais says he didn't need to make wudu. He never slept. His blessed eyes would close, his heart was always awake. Always. So do other human beings do that? You get up for Fajr and go pray? We're in Medina, subhanAllah. This guy was in front of us from Maghrib to Lisha, knocked out. You know, not sleeping like this where some of them say it's fine. He was sleeping like this morning. He got up for Isha and he's like, Allah, what for me? My friend are like, he did this guy's a wedding. He just went made wudu. We just didn't see it. Or this poor guy, what the heck is he doing? Does he not know as a Muslim, you can't sleep, get up and make wudu? And we heard him snoring. So like... SubhanAllah. It's really shameful. But this is part of the problem with the Muslims of our time. And we need to correct and fix it. And they say, oh, the Prophet was just a man. Abu Bakr said what he said because there are people, he's reminding them that death is something everyone's going to go through. Even the prophets, even the angels, everyone will die. Right? So it's like, remember guys, you can't lose it now that he's passed on. We were told he's going to pass on. This is from Abu Bakr. Because Omar was in the street with a sword. And he said, anyone who says the Prophet has passed, I'm going to let him have it. He went to his Lord. He's in shock. And that's why people now, they don't have any clue of the love of the Sahaba. Why would Omar lose it like us? Omar ibn Khattab is a tough guy. Toughest. Prophet Sallallahu said, Omar goes one way, Shaitan will flee another. But their love for Rasulullah is beyond, beyond understanding. They yearned and loved him like we can never understand. Sayyidah Fatima, Prophet Sallallahu told her that she would be the first to die right after. Go tell a normal Muslim, you're going to die in six months. They'll start crying like crazy. Aisha, uh, Fatima started laughing and so happy. Of course, she first cried and laughed because he said, I'm good, your father's going to leave soon. And then he said, but you'll be the first to join me. That's their, it's really, it hurts and it's very sad because I love the Prophet Sallallahu more than myself. Inshallah, Allah We cannot sit around for people to say things about him and just stay quiet and have respect for them. Absolutely not. There are people that Allah has yakhdaluhum. Allah has forsaken them, abased them, and they will meet their Lord. In the Qadi Iyad Shifa, they say the Shifa is Shifa. The Shifa of Imam Qadi Iyad, the best book our Shaykh always recommends reading, 
from the great scholar of Maghrib. In it, there's a man who called the Prophet Sallallahu in a disrespectful way, uh, you know, by a term, and he was actually killed for it as a result. So, of course, we're not saying go around and kill somebody who says something bad about the Prophet. That's not what we're saying. We're saying the respect Muslims had for him was an absolute respect that people were very cautious before they opened their mouth to talk about the Messenger of God, the one who only his name is on the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a balance. Of course we don't worship the Prophet and of course the Prophet made dua and asked Allah to be protected from that people worship him. And Allah accepted that. Nobody's going to worship the Prophet Sallallahu However, there are people that say, well, we're afraid because Muslims go to extreme. Please inform me what extreme did they go to? Oh, they praise him too much. And what did they say about him? What did they say about him? What did Allah say about him? Then let's see what you said about him. And Allah's praise is pre-eternal. I mean, think of two ayahs in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about his prophet, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You have a khuluq عظيم. In the Arabic format, it's basically saying, any characteristic that's out there, yours is more supreme and great. When Allah says Adim, this is actually unimaginable for us what Allah means when He says Adim. This is a praise of Allah. Also, in Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. You think about this. Allah and all of His angels. Once I asked my teacher, I said, Shit, yusalluna, hal huwa kullu malaika? Is this all of the angels? Every single angel? He looked at me, he said, Allah. What are you talking about, the angels? You mean, in Allah. Well, who are the angels? What's an angel to Allah? Allah is Allah. And Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Think about this. Please, once these guys think about that real good in their head, you come back that this is what Allah is doing at all times. يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي What praise are you talking about? Once again, I'm sorry, what praise was that? Sayyidah Aisha said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahsanu minka lam More beautiful than you, no woman ever gave birth to. And more excellent and handsome than you, no eye has ever seen. You're free from every blemish. It's as if you got to create and design your own self. And on and on. Hassan ibn Thabit was sent to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I remember some of these. لَمَّا نَظَرْتُ إِلَىٰ أَنْوَارِهِ سَطَعَتْ وَضَعْتُ كَفِّي فِي عَيْنِ مِنْ خِيفَةِ حُسْنِهِ There's some lines I have. So when Hassan saw him, he said, I put my hand on my eyes and moved away. This is when he was not a Muslim. He said, in fear of my eye from the beauty of his face. أَلَنْوَارُهُ I have written this. أَلَنْوَارُ مِنْ نُورِهِ سَطَعَتْ Do you know those lines here? Inshallah, I'll pull it out. So his anwar, his lights were drowning in other lights. Ruhum min al-nuri wal jismu min al-qamari. It's a beautiful praise. After Hassan ibn Thabit saw him, he went back to his people. He's like, like, what happened? He said, I've never seen anybody like this. And he became Muslim later. So yes, we tell people very clearly, don't worship the Prophet, you'll go to hell for it. Worshipping, and that's why Imam al Busiri says in the Burda, Leave what the Nasara said about his new, about the Prophet, that he's God or God incarnate or the Son of God or divine or poor part of God. You'll go to hell for that for sure, if you believe that. After that, ascribe to him any praise and beauty you want, because you won't reach it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's a lot of... Uh, Great scholars written works on this, inshallah. Please stay in touch. I'll send you some beautiful recordings on that. As Rabi al Awwal is coming close and the ulama will start a lot of talks on that topic, we'll actually cover a, a series of talks in Santa Barbara as well on that, inshallah. Sure, take two quick questions. Uh, this is very quick. Uh, can you put some light on sending the blue on the left hand on, on the Quran? Do you want some durud from the Quran? No, no. And that says, Inna Allah wa malayhi. Yeah. What? Right. Yeah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, uh, put a little bit light on it. Sure. Thank you. 
So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells that to and says about the angels, then He commanded us to send salutations and peace upon the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by sending our salutations. In Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Man salla alayhi wa hidatan sallallahu alayhi wa ashara wa kama qal, whoever prays on me one time, Allah will pray on them ten times. This is from a hadith. The other ayah is from the Quran. Ya yuhalladheena amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. That's the part of the next part of it. This ayah is in Surah Al-Ahzab. That, oh, you believe, pray upon him. Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Send, send durood, basically. And my teacher, I spoke to him about this, and there's a beautiful scholar from Mauritania. He wrote a book in which he basically says, anyone who loves the Prophet, abides and lives by his blessed sunnah, and follows him inwardly and outwardly, is always praying on the Prophet, even if his lips are not praying on him. And anyone who is disobeying the Messenger of Allah, and lacks the knowledge, and does not follow his sunnah, he is in reality not praying on the Prophet, even if his lips are praying on the Prophet. Sidi Abdullah ibn Hajj Ibrahim, he's the greatest Usuri scholar of Mauritania. He has a book on this. So, if you're righteous, the point is, if you're righteous, and you're lying, your actions are in line with what? What did we say the first day? They have their first based on knowledge. What did Ibn al-Mundir say? You're not allowed to act, do, or intend anything until you know what Allah told you in it. So that's first one. After knowledge, you do the action in the way that the Messenger Sallallahu did it. So if you want a perfected way, you make wudu like he made wudu. You pray as he prayed. You do everything in line with the sunnah. Otherwise, it's a reality, a type of bid'ah. You follow that. So... Amaluk muwafaq li sharia. They're in line with the sharia. The intention is precedes that by you knowing that actually the Prophet did this action like this. This was makru. This is allowed to you do it exactly in line. If you do it that way, this is called amila saliha. Deeds that are made corrected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say except those who believe and do good or just do. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا عَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ okay, The scholars, they mention, it can only be salihat if it's preceded by knowledge of it. Imam al-Bukhari has a chapter which is called The Chapter of Knowledge Before Action. The Chapter of Knowledge Before Action. Knowledge is the condition before every action. You cannot go give zakat and say, Bismillah, inshallah, 100 bucks should cover it all, Bismillah. No, you have to actually go see exactly how much money you have. Exactly how long you had. Did you have debts? You calculate everything. You say, my zakat is a hundred exactly. And then you give it in line with how the Prophet taught us. You can't guess it. You can't do those things. You have to know exactly what Allah and His Messenger have laid down. When you don't have that knowledge, you're not doing things correctly. Then in reality, you're not praying on the Prophet ﷺ. But if we are love him, follow him, and um, do everything exactly in line, it's like we're praying on him all the time even if we're not technically praying. There's other proofs for that. People were busy teaching knowledge. They didn't get the chance to make dua. In one hadith, that says Allah will give them more than those guys who had time to make dua. Because they're in service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a lot of proofs for that. So, you know, Salawat is beautiful. It's a lot of great books. The Indian subcontinent is very famous for that. Sheikh Zakaria Kandahlawi, rahimahullah, has a wonderful book called The Fadail of Salawat. It's a fantastic book, one of my favorite which is pretty much taken from the Qawl of uh, Badi of Imam al-Sakhawi. Um, lots of salawat, lots of fadail of salawat, how it... SubhanAllah, there's so many beautiful stories in there. People whose parents were saved based on the salawat of their children. Where a man saw his father's face turn really um, dark. And Sheikh Zakaria was like one of the greatest scholars of this last century, an Indian scholar had a lot of connection to a lot of Arab scholars and had love for knowledge and deen. He's well known. He has the famous book, Fadaili Amal, Rahimullah Ta'ala. And in that book, in this case, he said that the, the son, he gets really sad and he goes to sleep and he sees the Prophet And the Prophet told him, because you prayed on me so much, I'm going to ask for your father's forgiveness. And when he opened his eyes, he saw his father's face lit. And that's, Waladun Salih yad'u lahu, a righteous son and child you leave behind to pray for you. If you have a righteous child, the benefits will reach the parent. Because you're salih. You know, you're people that you put your hand up and Allah will answer you. 
And you look up the hadith of the Arba'een of Imam al -Nawul. There are people very special with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who when they ask Allah, Allah for sure answers them. And this is the benefit of dua and asking dua. So salawat is very beautiful. I recommend all of you have something of salawat that you read. Subhanallah, Imam ibn Atayla, he says something so ajeeb. The great Egyptian alim and wali and salih and master of all the Sufis and a correct scholar no one ever objected to in hundreds and hundreds of years. Imam ibn Atayla, rahimullah, he says, if when you pray on the Prophet one time and Allah sends ten on you of his mercies, if one of those mercies would reach you, it's enough for your world and your hereafter. There's a hadith that whoever prays on me once, he gets ten. Salawat from Allah. Whoever prays ten, gets a hundred. Whoever prays a hundred will get a thousand, and whoever prays a thousand will be written on his forehead. Bari'atu mina nifaq, freed from hypocrisy, will be given Jannah, and all this khayr that will come about. And there are the great Badr al-Din al-Hassani of uh, Syria, one of the last of the scholars, they said he memorized all the six books of Hadith and all their train. He used to read about 30,000 salawat a day when the Prophet says that. And there's many other people, they would send 10,000, 5,000. Sheikh Muhammad Yaqubi, somebody came to him and said, I'm going to give you a word and I guarantee if you do it, you'll get corrected. The guy said, SubhanAllah, okay, what should I do? He said, read 10,000 times a day, Astaghfirullah. I mean, if somebody is engaging all the Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, like, either you don't know what you're saying in Arabic, it's hard to just go and do what you're doing after that. As our problem with the heart is the heart needs to get cleansed from all this darkness and all this sin and all this love of the world by light. And there's no better light, let's make that clear, there's no better light than gatherings of knowledge. Absolutely none. One gathering of knowledge is better than 60 years of worship. It's a hadith. One gathering of knowledge is better than 60 years of worship. And our Shaykh once said, Masakeen, poor guys. They come to the masjid to pray Isha because everybody knows you get nisf al as if you're in prayer. And if you get Fajr, mashallah, you stayed up the whole night. He said, Masakeen, poor guys. They don't know one majlis of fiqh, one majlis of knowledge. It's 60 years of that. Where are the people running to the Duru's Sununda knowledge? None. There are people, they'll run to the masjid for the salah, they'll never come to a dars with the imam or the shaykh. None. There are people that'll go to Juma after Juma, but they've never been in attendance of one knowledge. One gathering of knowledge, you might learn something that'll affect your al-aytiqad, your aqidah, your practice that may save you. Maybe somebody thought, when you make wudu, you don't have to wipe this back area. He goes to a, a gathering of knowledge, and the imam shows how you go. He goes, oh, I didn't like that. Oh. Well, you could have done that for 60 years, your prayer is not even valid, or you just learned something that will benefit you for the next 60 years. Or a sister goes to the gathering and somebody says, if you have nail polish, you can't wipe over that. This is not khufs. You can't do a qiyas on that. You have to actually take it off. Okay? And then they go, oh, I didn't know that. From now on, mashallah, okay. Maybe I'll take it off and make wudu. And God, I just can't let it go. So I will put it back on after I make wudu. And inshallah khair. Okay? Whatever. But then they realize. And I've got people, they come to me and say, I do mess on that. They say, mess? I didn't know mess on that. Right? Because they don't know. And so learning is prior to acting. In fact, they say, if you act without knowledge, you're a criminal. You're a criminal because you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah commanded people to first learn what He obligated. It's in every mutun, every mutun, every metan of fiqh. They say, a man went to West Africa, the, the great scholar there, Shaykh Haddamin, Hafizullah, they went to him, and this guy went from England, basically. He said, Shaykh, I heard Mauritania is really great. I want to memorize the Quran in like 10 months. I heard you can do that, inshallah. So I'm ready. Bismillah. That's true, you can in 10 months. Mauritania, go sit in a tent with the law. No distractions, no nothing. By the way, your phone won't even work, so no distraction, nothing works, okay? It's you, the stars, the tent, and a few ulama and some sheep and stuff like that, okay? So he's like, I can do it. And then uh, the sheikh said, by the way, the uh, guy goes, not with a scholar, I've never studied, no. And he goes, you have to first read that. Because it's haram for you to learn the Quran without first learning that. So the guy goes, okay. He starts learning tahara, and first aqeedah, then tahara, then salah. He's months and months already on that. 
because it's not permissible to learn the Quran without that. None whatsoever. It's haram. In fact, if a person were to go into the masjid and doesn't know the rules of the masjid, it's impermissible he puts his foot in the masjid till he learns and knows the rules of the masjid. Like if you're in Janaba, you can't enter the masjid. But well, what's Janaba? Ah, that's a bab and fiqh. You have to go learn. Ah, oh, man, I didn't know that one. You can't go do that before you enter and do anything. This is all knowledge obligatory. And if you do anything other than seeking that, you're committing a sin. And most imams are failing in informing the people. And my teacher calls them mujrimun too, criminals, because they're misleading the people. People don't know how to make tahara. They're skipping their prayers and then they want to know about it. Tell us why when the Prophet went to heaven, like what happened up there? Do you know how to make wudu? No. Let's talk about that first. Maybe. And then we can get to it. Or how about we first do one hour fifth, then we can talk about it. Something. You know, so inshallah, I hope I've delivered the message for everyone to study, study, study. You got a beautiful imam right here. Poor guy gave a lot of his years to knowledge. Get a metan of, he said, Hanafi, I'm a Hanafi. Go get a metan of fiqh and Hanafi and say, you have to teach me. It's fard on you or Mufti Shujat or one of you. You got to teach me. Bab al tahara Bab al salat Bab al zakat keep, keep busy with that few years and then come to other matters. And they love uh, students because I know imams don't have any students. If they have a tafsir class, everybody comes. MashaAllah, the band, Bismillah, al isti'ana, what this, MashaAllah, MashaAllah. So, what's fard of the salat? What do you mean, what's fard? No, like, what if you left out makes your prayer batal? Wudu? No, no, no. Actual fard of the salat, fidakir. Let me give you an example. In the Maliki Madhab and the Shafi Madhab. If you do not recite Fatiha correctly, your prayer is not valid. Your prayer is not valid. Why? Because Fatiha, we Hanafis would say, is from the Faraid of the Salat. And if you mess it up, where you don't do the, even the Ulama of Qur'an, the real scholars, they say like, you leave out the Shadda. Wrong. Hanafis, you might get away as long as you read an ayah prayer. But a Maliki? No. Salat kum batil. It's not valid. In Salat, when you start and you say, Allahu Akbar, prayer is bottled from the very beginning. Because you didn't say Allah is great, you said, is Allah great in the Arabic language? And if you extend where you have no right to extend in Tajweed, you're committing a wrong. When you say, Allahu Akbar, who said you extend the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like that? No scholar allows it. So all oh, look, just in Takbir. How many little rulings are attached? That's serious. Right? So that's what you got to learn. Once you learn that, you're like, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. Let's do seerah shit. Let's talk about hadith. Let's talk about tafsir. Because I'm not messing up my prayer. And before that, by the way, I used to think Allah's looking at me behind my apartment. But now, Alhamdulillah, I know He sees me from what I cannot understand. Yeah, you got to fix those things. Then you can move on to talk about other things. Until then, you have not. And also about the rank of the Prophet ﷺ, this is very dangerous. People going around and saying, he's just a human being. Oh, don't praise him. Don't. A'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. Stay away from that. You got to also learn. What is the rights of the Prophet and What did the ulama write about him? That's very important too. You know? And I'll leave you with, uh, inshallah, uh, that's, that's the advice. Is seek knowledge. Get the books, inshallah, that you need to study and go one by one. And inshallah, please uh, pray for me and make dua for me and my family and my teachers and our communities. And may Allah bless you all and give you... Great openings, inshallah, tawfiq. Uh, those of you that didn't know, but um, I have a non-profit organization called The Blessed Tree, and it's called theblessedtree.org. i uh, love to have any of you support us in any way, um, both spreading it to people that you know. Um, I do a lot of interfaith and outreach work, but we also do a lot of um, in the community work with teaching children, teaching teenagers, teaching adults. And we often do once a month seminars where we have a teacher from West Africa who comes to Santa Barbara. And we have, uh, we've had probably about 100 lectures online, but we do different programs of what is needed for Muslims at the time. So inshallah, if you can support, that'll be really great. And uh, I want to thank all the organizers and the people that were involved in this. Jazakumullah khair. And I ask Allah Ta'ala for forgiveness of anything I said that may have been wrong or any slips. Uh, therefore myself, whatever tawfiq was given, is Allah created all of those in those moments, and He's the one that did everything, we had nothing. And Allah only accepts from the people of taqwa, 
We're not from the people of Taqwa, but we beg Allah to accept it on behalf of, on the virtue of his fadl, out of his bounty, not because of what we deserve, because we don't deserve anything. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad. Anyone who further wants any questions, ask that you didn't reach me. You can email me at askyama at gmail.com. Askyama at gmail.com. And inshallah, I hope some of you, I see you, you have started something with Sidi Yahya or Sidi Shujad, and inshallah, study one of the texts. First, aqidah, then fiqh, then tasawwuf. Okay, tasawwuf. Meaning and tasawwuf, what's safe, stick to the books of tasawwuf. Matharat al Qulub is a great book from West Africa. Muhammad Mawlud, Shaykh Hamza Yusuf translated it. Don't read translations, you need to learn it from an alim. It's the purification of the heart and the diseases. So these three, Iman, Islam, Ihsan. Iman, Islam, Ihsan. Aqeedah, Fiqh, Tasawwuf. All three. These are branches every Muslim has to study. <laughs> Al-Akhir